I mean, who would ever have expected theology to rear its head once more in the, in the technocratic 21st century, almost as surprisingly, perhaps, as a mass revival of Neoplatonism? I mean, why is it that my local bookshop at home has suddenly sprouted a section labeled atheism and might even, who knows, be now planning one you know, marked empiricist skepticism with Anglican leanings or something <laughs> of the kind. You know. I mean, what on earth is going on here? Uh, I mean, why, put it another way, you know, why just as we were apparently confidently moving into a post-metaphysical, post-theological, even post-historical era, has the God question suddenly broken out anew? Uh, can one simply put it down to fanatical Islamists and falling towers. I don't really think we can, at least not for the most part. Uh, certainly, Ditchkins' distaste for religion didn't sprout from the ruins of the World Trade Center. That's just chronologically mistaken. It's true, I think, that quite a lot of the debate took its cue from there. Uh, an ominous fact, I think, since an intellectual debate is not best, best served when it springs from grief hatred, hysteria, humiliation, and the urge for vengeance, along with some deep-seated racist fears and fantasies. But 9-11 wasn't, I think, really about religion any more than the war that's been waged where I come from in Northern Ireland for the past 30 years was about papal infallibility. Um, for one thing, radical Islam, as I said before, generally understands exceedingly little about its own religious faith. And there's also good evidence, surely, that uh, its actions are largely politically driven, not theologically driven, but politically driven. Um, but I think there's a deeper issue at stake here, which is that f Islamic fundamentalism confronts Western civilization not only with blood and fire, but with the contradiction between the West's own need to believe and its chronic incapacity to do so. It's that paradox or conflict which, as it were, Islamic radicalism writes large. It brings out something embedded, something contradictory, embedded in Western culture itself. I mean, the West now stands eyeball to eyeball with a full-blooded, if you like, metaphysical foe for whom absolute truths and foundations pose utter no problem whatsoever. I mean, would that they did, would that they did, uh, at just the point, at just the point where a West in the throes of late modernity or post-modernity, whatever you want to call it, skates up by on believing as little as it decently can get away with, um, in post-Nietzschean spirit, it appears to be, and I've touched on this theme before, appears to be busily undermining its own erstwhile metaphysical foundations with its unholy melange of practical materialism, political pragmatism, moral and cultural relativism, and philosophical skepticism. All this, so to speak, is the price you pay for affluence, and that might not matter so much, except that suddenly you then find yourself, as I say, eyeball to eyeball, with an enemy who seems metaphysically speaking, foundationally speaking, as it were, much more resourceful and better equipped than you do, in the way, since you're in the process of arguing all that away. It's not quite, to go back again to something that I've talked about before, it's not quite that, uh, I mean, there does seem to be an irony, doesn't there, as I said before, that just at the point where the West seems to be abandoning grand narratives, um, a new one, that of the, which no doubt sets the tone for the next century or so, that of the war between capital and the Quran, or a certain reading of the Quran, broke out at that very point to confound, as it were, the death of history merchants. That's an, ir an irony worth noting, but to put it that way, I think, misses the connection between the two. Not just, as it were, a contingent fact that the one happened and then the other did. Announcing the death of history, meaning, of course, that capitalism will only ever be the, ev ever the, the only game in town, is the intellectual or one intellectual reflex of a real-life campaign of Western global domination, which then triggers a backlash 
in the form of launching a new grand narrative of so-called terror, so that, as it were, the very act of attempting to close down history involves riding roughshod over a number of people who then, by backlash, launch a new kind of grand narrative, leaving you in the uh, unlikely situation of having, as it were, opened up a new grand narrative precisely in the attempt to close one down. Uh, to, to talk about a Western campaign of global uh, domination is not, of course, some lurid leftist rhetoric, but the stated plan of America in the new century, the stated plan of the neoconservative gangsters who hijacked the White House, but in other words, that American assured and unassailable American dominion, global dominion, would be the agenda from now on. One of many reasons, of course, why the nation has been so utterly discredited in the eyes of so many throughout the world. So closing down grand narratives in the very, uh, opening them up in the very act of closing them down is, as I think I said before, not a new phenomenon. It happened with Hegel, for example. Uh, no sooner had the glad tidings been announced in the West that so-called grand narratives were now definitively over and we could all engage in micropolitics, namely politics so small as to be invisible. Um, no sooner had that happened than uh, the West's own predatory political actions, not just recently, but for a long, long time in the Muslim world, helped to give birth to a new kind of grand narrative, that of Islamic radicalism. There's always been, to be sure, I, again, I think I've touched on this previously, there's always been, to be sure, a kind of built-in contradiction um, in capitalism between what in old-fashioned Marxist terms, and I'm very old-fashioned like Marxist, uh, we, we might call base and superstructure. I think I've, I've mentioned this before. In other words, modern market societies tend to be inherently uh, secular, relativist, pragmatist, rationalist, materialistic. Not just as it were that they adopt these philosophies or ideologies, having chosen them you know, from among a row of others, but there's something, these ideas, these values and beliefs are, as it were, built into a certain kind of secularizing market rationality. Um, the problem being, of course, that those values are then bound to exert a certain subversive influence on the religious and metaphysical superstructure, which exists, among other things, to legitimate the very market order itself. That is, I think, a contradiction from which capitalism is absolutely incapable of fundamentally escaping, though it can find various strategies for, nego for as it were, closing the circle here. I mean, you know, you just can't really, with any plausibility, appeal to the Virgin Mary or the platonic forms, you know, in the course of discussion in the World Bank. You know, it just doesn't have any kind of convincing ring to it in the least, you know. But you might find yourself, you see, ultimately, when you're back to the wall, in a situation where something like that, like that incongruity, has to take place. But otherwise, you're forced to question whether your superstructural or metaphysical values or foundational values are really meshing any longer with what you actually do. And when what you actually do no longer meshes with what you say you do, that's to say, with the ways you describe what you do to yourself, when, in short, you have what the linguisticians would call a performative contradiction at the level, however, here of a whole society, then you are, in ide ideologically speaking, in big trouble. When there's not sufficient fit between what you do and how you explain that to yourself or to others, you have to, as it were, maybe wheel in some new kind of discourse which will account for the gap between them. Uh, the metaphysicians of the religious right are, of course, seeking to put that superstructure back in place, which is one of several senses in which postmodern relativism breeds redneck fundamentalism. They are, of course, sides of the same coin. They paint each one another constantly into a corner. Yes, they bounce off each other all the time. What's happened, however, with the, the advent of Islamic terrorism, I think, is that some of these built-in contradictions in the West have been dramatically highlight, highlighted. As I say, it's not just a matter of two antagonists squaring up to each other across the globe. It's a matter of one of them, Islamism, so to speak, um, highlighting, showing up certain inherent conflicts and problems in Western liberal societies themselves. Um, 
I should, however, add, uh, of course, there's always, there's always the exception of good old America, uh, in contrast, you know, to godless Europe. Um, that America seems to have done quite a good job, I don't know how exactly, of managing this contradiction between, you know, secular base and metaphysical superstructure as at once, you know, one of the most grossly materialist but also one of the most high-mindedly metaphysical societies in the world. The, the metaphysical pitch of American political ret rhetoric is astounding to a European as I think I might have said before. America sounds to us full of a kind of sonorous, solemn, hand on heart, a rather earnest Arnoldian discourse of God, freedom, nation, and family, that particular poisonous little social unit, particularly, um, you know, much beloved of advertisers, and you know, the chosen people versus the powers of evil and all that. Um, which, as I've said before, tends to sound, is very different, I think, from a standard European kind of political discourse. Um, but which seems, this is my point, which seems to coexist for the most part easily enough uh, with the discourse of postmodern skepticism or you know, consumerist hedonism. Somehow, you know, Forrest Gump and Kill Bill go together. You know, somehow, they are you know, parts of the divided, but nonetheless the same type of sensibility. Um, there is, of course, let me just touch very briefly on a huge contradiction, which I, I won't say anything about. There is, of course, another inherent contradiction in liberal capitalism, but it's um, the fact, exacerbated by the war on terror, the fact, but, but always there, a, a running incipient contradiction then suddenly dramatically projected onto a global stream, namely the fact that violence is necessary in defense of freedom but will always risk scuppering that freedom in the process. So that if you push that process too far, you genuinely have to ask, what is it now we're defending? And it may be that that's precisely one of the strategies of Islamic radicalism, to push you where you find that in the act of defending your society, you've got no values left to defend. That might be the ultimate victory, so to speak. Economic liberalism, I mean, good old-fashioned uh, possessive individualism uh, rides roughshod over peoples and nations and communities uh, but triggers in that process just the kind of violent backlash that social and cultural liberalism are late least equipped to handle. This as it were is now a contradiction you might say within liberalism itself between its economic and political practice in the world the backlashes that that breeds and then the attempt of, as it were, a more socially minded or cultural liberalism to respond to that. In this sense too then, terrorism, the war on terror so-called, highlight, highlight certain contradictions endemic in, uh, in the society. Just pause to take a bit of a story of this. Then. For one thing, liberal pluralism can't help involving a certain indifference to the substance of belief. This is a kind of problem for it. It's one of its values, of course, but it's also a sort of problem for it, not least in this kind of political crisis. Um, because, of course, liberal societies don't so much hold beliefs as believe that people should be allowed freely to hold beliefs. That's their belief. Yes. Um, such cultures display a, a a supposedly creative indifference to what people actually believe as long as they can get on with the business of believing it and, importantly, as long as those beliefs don't jeopardize the very principles of freedom and tolerance which underpin this liberal doctrine. Yeah? Liberal society's summum bonum is leaving believers to get on with it unmolested, rather as the English would certainly walk by you if you were bleeding in the gutter not because they're particularly hard-hearted, but because they would not like to interfere with your privacy. <laughs> so the problem, problem is that such a society fosters necessarily, and in many ways for the good, um, a kind of purely formal or procedural approach to belief, which involves, as it were, keeping two strong identities at a certain ironic arm's length, entertaining them, allowing them to flourish, but keeping them a certain ironic arm's length. Liberal societies, one long 
unruly, eternally inconclusive argument. I say eternally inconclusive because I suppose modernity is a period, liberal modernity, is a period in which astonishingly we have to come to terms with the fact that we disagree on fundamentals and probably always will. Uh, something that would surely have struck um, you know, many a medieval person as very strange indeed. Not that, as we might have thought, we agree on the fundamentals, but we differ on you know, the details, but that although almost everybody agrees that burning people, innocent people slowly over fires is not the most desirable thing to do, we can't agree on why we agree on that. Moreover, we'll probably have to just put up with that situation for a long time. That, however, is not an easy thing to put up with because non-agreement, non-consensus for a liberal society is dangerous. It, can also, it means conflict, and conflict can break out in more physical forms that then can threaten the very basis of that society itself. So there's an, a long and inconclusive, eternally inconclusive argument, which is called liberal society, and that's a source of value, but it's also a source of vulnerability, and particularly when, as I say, you're up against people for whom what it was, belief of a quite foundational kind is absolutely no problem. That's not, of course, to say that liberalism, liberals have to be lukewarm. Liberalism, that's a mistake, I think, about the nature of liberalism. Liberalism doesn't have to be lukewarm. I mean, classical liberal, liberalism can be passionate about its own principles without violating its belief in tolerance and respect. I mean, you can be sort of suitably closed-minded about being open-minded. And how closed-minded about being open-minded you should be is now a big, an issue of high of contention. It may not always be put in that way, but you know, what we are allowed to do or reject in the name of preserving freedom or open-mindedness is of course an enormously important political issue. Uh, quite a lot of postmodernism, I think, is, is in some ways an heir to this mighty liberal tradition, although it might be described as a sort of liberalism without a subject, somehow. Um, it's, but a lot of postmodernism is open to beliefs not, as with the best kind of liberalism, despite a, a principled repugnance to certain beliefs. They're not open to them and tolerant of them despite a certain principled repugnance, but because of a sort of marketplace indifference to them. Um, and that's not to suggest that you know, Bin Laden couldn't profit from a healthy dose of postmodern skepticism, self-irony, and anti-foundationalism. Of course he would, yes. But there are dangers there too, as far as this question of the purely formal or procedural nature of belief goes. I mean, there is, for example, think of the difference here between tolerance in the, in the classical liberal sense and forgiveness, which obviously have certain kinds of things in common. But you know, a certain kind of liberal or more so postmodern tolerance doesn't really care what you believe in. Um, whereas forgiveness means, of course, being deeply injured, really caring about it, seeing with cold-eyed realism the worst about both the offence and the offender, uh, yet despite this, managing to embrace him or her in a solidarity which is far removed from some kind of spiritual laissez-faire. Um, economic liberalism uh, creates a spiritual and material wasteland in which people feel quite often they must cling to some fairly exclusivist doctrine or copper-bottomed form of identity. Yeah? Um, if they're to preserve the, fate, the faintest notion of who they are. In that sense, too, economic liberalism generates certain forms of fundamentalism. Um, most, a lot of those people who feel those anxieties, because, of course, fundamentalism is really about deep, deep anxieties, just as hatred is, I suppose, for the most part, the effect of anxiety, most of those people can see well enough that, that liberal pluralism is really for those who don't have to worry about who they are. No. Um, it's all very well being a liberal pluralist if you, don't, if you don't have to carry your identity as a painful burden on your back all the time, which of course is the unlikely, the unwelcome um, uh, lot of people who are oppressed or people who are, un who are made unhappy by their 
situations in various ways. And the point for those people is not to then assert some uh, essentialist identity, some essence of identity. Um, I am, incidentally, a card-carrying essentialist and believe that's a radical doctrine, but we'll leave that aside. Uh, but to get to, to get to the point where, like the other people, they no longer need to worry about who they are, to create the kinds of situations in which that is no longer a problem for them, or, or, in, or in which they can, as it were, become what they desire to be. Yes. Um, at the same time, um, another, another reason why, as it were, Western capitalism, late capitalism, is lackadaisical about belief um, is that it seeks to secure for itself a kind of automated or built-in consent, which doesn't really depend, perhaps, all that much on what its citizens actually think or what its citizens actually believe. We might, as it were, particularly the left, might be in danger of overestimating the importance of ideology in that respect. I just float this as a hypothesis. Capitalism isn't the kind of life form which exacts too much spiritual commitment from its citizens. You know, as long as they you know, get out of bed and consume and pay their taxes and refrain from beating up police officers, you know, as long, that is to say, as the system's hegemony is confirmed and reproduced in fairly you know, practical, material ways, then what goes on in the hearts and heads of the populace is a strictly secondary affair. It's not as though they can believe whatever they like. Obviously, certain beliefs will be subversive and dangerous, but well, there's a lot of latitude in that. Belief is not probably, it's probably not what keeps the system ticking over, as belief is what keeps the Lutheran church ticking over, if indeed it is ticking over, which I have no idea about. Um, in other words, late, there's a sense in which late capitalism is intrinsically agnostic. And this makes it look particularly flabby when its paucity of belief comes up against an excess of it. Um, and not only an, an, an external excess in the form of a, you know, a foreign enemy, um, but of course internal excesses too in the form of the various homegrown domestic fundamentalisms which the system tends to breed. The very pluralism to which you appeal as a potent source of spiritual authority has a fatally weakening effect on your, pol on your political authority, not least when you're up against the kind of bigots who regard that pluralism as a source of moral weakness. I mean, the idea, apparently beloved of some Americans, that, you know, Islamic radicalism, radicals do what they do because they're envious of Western freedom. One heard a lot of that in the wake of 9-11. is about as persuasive as the idea that you know, all Islamic radicalisms want, want to do is sit in cafes smoking dope and reading Gilles Deleuze. Yeah. Um, the trouble is then that freedom and democracy involve a degree of conflict and diversity which might not which some might think is not the thing you really want, you know, when you're up against people who are trying to dismember you. On the other hand, as I pointed out before, if you surrender freedom and democracy, then what exactly is it that you're clinging to? What is it that you have to defend? Multiculturalist ideology, with, with its sometimes rather blandly formalistic embrace of belief as some of belief as such, once again rather like a certain kind of classical liberalism, multiculturalism tends to, uh, as it were, acknowledge the fact of belief, or the fact of a variety of beliefs, rather than uh, inquiring substantively into the belief itself. In doing so, it makes a very common mistake, a uh, mistake made by postmodernism as such, of imagining the astonishing uh, idea that somehow um, diversity is a, is a good in itself. You know, um, Somehow heterogeneity or multiplicity, you know, or words with an S on the end, you know, like cultures, or, you know, are intrinsically superior to you know, non-diversity or, 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 or unity. I mean, I you know, may just be eccentric, but the idea of having 93 fascist parties around the place you know, instead of a single one, you know, I mean, I may be drearily pre-postmodern here in my dislike of heterogeneity, or, you know, 
breeding a multiplicity of social classes, you know, to make the ones we have look very impoverished. Um, you know, this extraordinary idea, really quite a, a universalist dogma on the part of some postmodernism, that multiplicity is always and everywhere so superior to the opposite. Um, multiculturalist ideology, because of its sort of arm's length or hands off or ironic relation to this diversity of beliefs, um, of course, tends a lot of the time to want to diffuse them, just as um, I think it's Alistair McIntyre points out that um, cult uh, cultural relativism, relativism or moral relativism is, among other things, a way of avoiding conflict. That is to say, if our positions are simply incommensurable, you know, if you think that patriarchy is uh, an oppressive social system, and I think it's a small town in upper New York State, you know, then, of course, we are not conflicting. We have no common ground on which to do so. Our positions are simply incommensurable, and therefore we can pass on to something else. Moral relativism is an attempt to diffuse conflict, among other things. And so, among, among other things, I think is, is, uh, is, is multiculturalism. Um, it, it, multiculturalism is, for example, extraordinarily coy of calling other people's beliefs, you know, um, arrant nonsense or unmitigated garbage, you know, which surely one has the right to do. Um, there are you know, a huge amount of garbage around the place that we have to name for what it is. You know, why not? One of the most admirable <coughs> aspects of Chris Hitchens' uh, God is Not Great, uh, a, a superbly stylish and well-argued book, um, is, uh, is that Hitchens believes that religion is disgusting and has absolutely no uh, qualms about saying so. I mean, he may be right or wrong about that, but he's, uh, he's properly unafraid to announce it and to take the consequences of it, including getting slagged off by me, his, his old comrade. Um, societies uh, for which abrasive criticism is automatically abusive, and the American abuse of the word abusive has now got to the point where you know, any mildly critical remark becomes abuse, you know, a sure sign of mind control if ever there was one, uh, such societies clearly have a problem. And multiculturalism doesn't help there. Um, so in a certain sense, what I'm arguing, I suppose, is that a surfeit of belief is what late capitalism has actually helped to spawn. Um, partly, uh, as I say, because by the, the sort of destructive global behavior uh, to which that superfluity of belief is, an, is a rather ugly and pathological reaction, but also for another reason, namely that um, a, rash, a kind of rationality that has grown too, you know, dominative and calculative and instrumental and all the sort of Frankfurt School cliches um, is simply too shallow a soil in which a reasonable kind of faith can take root, can flourish. And the consequence of that, very often, is that then faith lapses into fideism. Um, and from there, easily enough, to fanaticism, since fideism doesn't need to back itself up with the facts. Yeah. Um, rationalism and fideism then, in a strange way, I think, become each other's mirror image. The other side of a two-dimensional reason is, is a faith-based reality. Um, John Milbank writes that where reason has retreated, he says, there it seems faith has now rushed in, often with violent consequences. Reason, if, reason, if reason has trouble with value, then faith has trouble with fact, and the old value-fact dichotomy is thereby reintroduced. Fundamentalism is, of course, among other things, the visceral response of those driven into a kind of spiritual zealotry by a shallow technological rationality, which leaves all the most pressing cultural and metaphysical questions scornfully to one side, and therefore leaves them open to being monopolized by the rednecks and the bigots. Neoconservatism is, of course, I hardly need to say a species of fideism with its belief uh, untroubled in its ideological zeal by anything as trifling as reality. 
Conversely, reason, as I've said, as I said in, in last, uh, the last lecture, has to ground itself in something other than itself to be authentic, uh, not something which is unreasonable, but something which is other than reason. Um, if it doesn't do that, if it grounds itself largely in material interests and forms of political dominion, rather than, say, in some idea of peaceable community or some idea of loving fidelity, then faith and reason will simply spin apart from each other and each will become a caricature of itself, fideism and rationalism once again. There's another sense too, of course, a very obvious sense in which a paucity of belief of faith leads to a surplus of it, which is simply that if the West really did um, have faith in the Christian gospel of peace and fellowship, um, then it wouldn't you know, spend its time doing things like killing arming and championing those who kill Arab children on the West Bank and therefore wouldn't have to worry quite so much about people crashing its aircraft into nuclear reactors in the name of Allah. In other words, once again, the, uh, the lukewarmness of belief spawns on the other side of itself a kind of pathological surplus of it. Another contradiction I will simply touch on, which the war on terror has helped to foreground, is that economic liberalism, of course, generates mighty tides of global migration, uproots people from their homes, destroys or undermines whole communities, which then, when it comes home to the West, so to speak, um, generates a kind of multiculturalism. That's a problem, however, not only in the obvious sense that such multiculturalism may be a breeding ground for terrorists, but in a more subtle sense that, as I think I said before, Culture is what beds political power down. Culture is necessary for all kinds of reasons, no, not least because superfluity is necessary to us. One definition of culture is that which, is, which all flows the measure, which is not strictly necessary to us biologically. And as King Lear sees, you know, a lack of, I mean, superfluity is, or argue, not the need. Superfluity is part of what we are, what we need. Um, but also because culture is important here because um, if culture is what helps to bed power down, to naturalize, domesticate, make us live power on, the, on our pulses, on our bodies, in our spontaneous behavior, because power, as we know, will only survive in that way, uh, that's complicated if there are too many cultures around the place. That's complicated if power has to bed itself down simultaneously in a diversity of cultures who might interpret it in different ways. I think one of the problems of multiculturalism for, for the powers that rule us is precisely that. It's not just getting people to live well together. Um, it's precisely that. Part of what's happened in our time, you might say, is that God has shifted over from the side of civilization to the side of barbarism. This is a momentous event. He may not know this, but actually I'm telling him that it's true. Um, God is no longer, you know, the short-haired, blue-blazered God of the West. You know, or if he is, he's that now almost entirely in the United States and not in Porto or Cardiff or Bologna. Yes, but he is a wrathful, dark-skinned God who, if he did ever create John Locke or John Stuart Mill, has long ago forgotten about it. Um, uh, or might go further and claim not only that God has shifted over in our time from the side of civilization to the side of barbarism, but that the new form of barbarism is known precisely as culture. Culture, in a certain sense, has become the new form of barbarism. The age-old uh, antithesis between barbarism and civilization has been complicated at least by the entry onto the stage of a third term namely culture, which is not quite the one or the other, but which at the moment, geopolitically speaking, is in dire danger of being identified with barbarism. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean that the conflict is now apparently, or is presented to us very often, as one between civilization, meaning individuality, autonomy, universality, rational speculation, conscious judgment, and the like, and culture which means nothing at all like that. It means precisely all those supposedly unreflective loyalties and allegiances and uh, 
inherited affiliations, which are ap apparently as built into us as our liver or our pancreas, which we can't, as it were, get a fix on intellectually, and it would be a bad thing to do so, moreover, in certain ideologies of culture. Uh, that in the name of which men and women are prepared to kill or to be killed. Um, uh, they may be prepared to kill or be killed in the name of civilization. That's what people are supposed to be doing in Iraq, I suppose. But they're certainly prepared to, be, to kill or be killed in the name of culture because that implicates their identity, not just their material interests. And so on. Um, the problem, however, or one problem, however, is this, that if there's an increasing dichotomy between civilization and culture in our world, it's also true that the two things really have to go together. They have to go together because culture, in the sense of the, the, the medium of lived experience and lived identity, has to be the medium of abstract, reflective, universal values. Has to be, that's to say, the place where they mediate themselves, flesh themselves out as forms of practical reason. Culture is necessary for civilization as its very medium, the very medium which conducts, so to speak, its values into the interior of human subjects and embeds them there. Or to put the point a bit more cynically, uh, transnational corporations are, are completely cultureless and unlocalized in themselves. In, in this sense alone, they resemble the almighty, if in no other sense. The almighty is not cultural. Um, but, of course, transnational corporations must pay sedulous attention to how business is traditionally transacted in Colombo or Chittagong. You know, they must bring the, their global values or universals to bear on specific cultural situations if they're to make profit. If, they're to, if they ignore those specific cultural mediations, they will be at a disadvantage. Yet there's also, and this is the problem surely, there's also an intense antagonism between these two phenomena, civilization and culture, which the cultural supremacists in the West uh, increasingly have mapped onto a West-East axis. And that is, of course, among other things, to forget that Western civilization is riddled with cultures from end to end you know, gay culture, beach culture, police culture, deaf culture. The word culture has spawned in our day you know, to cover a variety of groups. And of course, that the, that the closed culture of Islamism is by no means a reflection of the civilization of the Islamic world as a whole. So one of the most pressing problems of our time, I think, is that civilization can neither dispense with culture nor can easily coexist with it. Civilization is precious but fragile. Culture is supposed to be red-blooded and potent. Civilizations kill to protect, that protect their material interests, whereas cultures kill to defend their identities. Um, and the more materialist and hard-headed civilizations become, the more they breed cultures as a reaction to themselves to fulfill the kinds of emotional and psychological needs which civilization can no longer really handle. They are, in that sense, the inheritors of romanticism, which try to do something of the same. Um, that which is meant to mediate universal values to people, namely culture, locality, particular traditions, particular senses of identity, ends up turning aggressively against those very values. Culture is the repressed, which returns as a vengeance, not least in the form of fascism, which is certainly a culture. But culture is also feminism and gay rights and, of course, the most astonishingly successful revolutionary movement which the West has ever witnessed, uh, the name of which I will tell you afterwards for a small fee if you're interested in it. Oh, well, okay, go on. Uh, revolutionary nationalism. Revolutionary nationalism is a culture uh, in all of those senses, a culture of identity and unity and tradition and symbol and language, all of which is then pitted against what's felt to be uh, a clapped out kind of civilization. Now, I haven't much time uh, to spare here. I was going to say, I just very lightly touch on all the uh, 
marvelous things I was going to tell you about without having the embarrassment of having to tell you about them, in which case you, know, you might think I'm wrong. Uh, but there's a sense in which religion falls on both sides simultaneously of this culture and civilization uh, dichotomy. Culture is, of course, you know, is a, uh, religion is, of course, doctrine, institution, authority, choirs, cathedrals, metaphysical speculation, um, but it's also culture. Christianity begins, you might say, as a culture and changes into a civilization. Religion in the United States, my hunch is, correct me if I'm wrong, is still something of a civilizational matter, whereas in England, it's largely a sort of cultural affair. You know, it's, it's a traditional way of life, rather more akin to high tea or clog dancing, you know, than it is to say socialism or Darwinism. Uh, and it would be bad form to take it too seriously. I mean, one of the very un-English aspects of the otherwise egregiously English uh, Dawkins is his getting so het up about religion. You know, as the Englishman said, it's when religion starts to interfere with your everyday life that it's time to give it up. Uh, <laughs> you know, one couldn't imagine, you know, the Queen's chaplain asking you if you've been washed in the blood of the Lamb or something of the kind. You know. uh, Poll, polling in England reveals that most of the English, uh, by a large majority actually, feel that religion has done far more harm than good in the world, which is hardly the result you get in Dallas, I suppose. Um, okay, uh, I'll just try and uh, cut some things out. Yes. Um, there are one or two, I'll just very quickly touch on one or two strategies whereby you can try to get yourself out of this dichotomy between civilization and culture. One of them is the sort of, um, one of them is to claim that civilization has chosen, as it were, um, certain places, certain localities, certain traditions in which to incarnate itself, in which to make itself flesh. You know, Geist in its wisdom has just happened to hit on, you know, Paris you know, rather than Birmingham. You know as a place to incarnate itself, which then in a certain way brings the universal and the local together at the cost of vast implausibility. A rather more bold-faced attempt to do this is, is, is the kind of attempt associated with interesting postmodern attempts associated with people like Richard Rorty, a name, incidentally, which I was convinced meant something, Rorty, so I looked it up in the Oxford English Dictionary, and indeed the OED defines Rorty as rowdy, boisterous, coarse, earthy and fun-loving, which is not exactly how I remember him, but anyway. <laughs> um, for this kind of case, Western civilization is indeed a culture in the sense of being entirely local and contingent, you know, among various other cultures, but it cl the case claims that its values should nevertheless be treated as though they were universal and foundational. In a, in a strange irony, it acknowledges that they're not foundational, not universal, but as it were, you can treat them as though they were. You can, in other words, abandon a rational defense of your way of life for a culturalist one, but the price of doing so is letting hold of any classical kind of foundationalism. All right. Um, all right, yes. Let me just say that... Um, uh, Um, yes, I'll, I'll just end by saying this. The, what we, it, the upshot of this, one upshot of this, is that we seem to be faced globally with a, a rather unwelcome, with a dilemma, with a rather unwelcome antithesis. The West either trusts in the power of, as it were, post-historical, post-metaphysical, post-theological pragmatism, anti-foundationalism, in the, in the teeth of the absolutism and foundationalism of its Islamic enemy, and that's a risky enterprise. Yeah? Or it falls back upon metaphysical values of its own, as the Western fundamentalists would, would, would insist, but that's, that those values are looking increasingly tarnished uh, in certain places, not least places outside the United States. I mean, in, they may in Dallas see God as you know, the great chief executive officer in the sky, but that's not likely to be a view endorsed in Manchester or Minster. So does the West need to go metaphysical to save itself? Is that what we need? 
And if it does, can it do so without inflicting too much damage on its liberal values, thus ensuring that there's still something worth protecting from its illiberal antagonists? Marxism held out a promise of reconciling culture and civilization. There's a long argument here that I can't now really get into, but Mar because Marx is, in a, se in a sense, at once a good old-fashioned Enlightenment rationalist concerned with universality and individuality and autonomy, and also a good old-fashioned romantic humanist concerned above all with sensuous specificity. The only hallmark of Marx, it's his dislike of abstractions for what he sees as essentially specific. Um, uh, in some sectors, on, on the other hand, given the enormous political rebuff that Marxism has taken, that baton has passed to uh, elsewhere. And one of those places, of course, unsurprisingly, in many ways, is theology. I mean, it's in some sectors of theology nowadays that one can find the most informed and animated discussions of Deleuze and Badiou, of Foucault and feminism, Marx and Heidegger, and so on. Not entirely surprising, perhaps, because theology is one of the most starkly ambitious theoretical arenas left to us in an increasingly specialist and fragmented world, one whose subject is nothing less than the nature and destiny of humanity itself in relation to what it takes to be its transcendent source. I mean, you try raising that kind of question in analytical philosophy or political science, you know, or you know, even in some theology, perhaps. You know. some, some theological departments might find themselves quite embarrassed by that. Um, so we find ourselves in a very curious and incongruous situation. We, we, a world in which indubitably theology is a massive part of the problem and has become so in new and unpredictable ways. Yes, as Ditchkin so rightly points out, so rightly points out, massively part of the problem, but where it also seems to be fostering kinds of critical reflectiveness which might just lead to some answers. Um, will either side at the moment in this debate, you know, listen to the other. Well, um, to use a suitably theological term, not a hope in hell. Uh, what's the line with which E.M. Foster ends uh, passage to India? Not here, not now, not yet. It's not to say not ever, but the conditions have to be right. And at the moment, for all kinds of geopolitical and ideological reasons, I think both sides are far too entrenched and somehow sometimes far too self-righteous to be able to listen to each other. Not, not, we, one is not able to listen to everything at any time. How far one can receive a message is shaped, of course, by one's situation. I don't believe for a moment that any, uh, unfortunately, you know, anything I've said in these lectures will make a blind bit of difference to the beliefs of Richard Dawkins or Chris uh, Hitchens. But um, that's not to say that under different sorts of conditions, uh, you know, not that instant conversions will happen, but we may be able to create the material and ideological situations in which some sort of more fruitful dialogue is finally possible. Can I just end, by, since this is the last of my lectures, by warmly thanking uh, uh, um, Laurel Lee Field for um, her effortless uh, efficiency in bringing me over here and making that whole business quite painless, as well as in her warm kindness and hospitality, which has helped being here, being such a pleasure, and also her uh, ably assisted by Barbara Mordecai. I'm very, very grateful. I'm also grateful to you for having taken the trouble to attend uh, so assiduously and actually to listen to what I've said, you know, and not to argue with me too much, you know, but just enough to make it seem as though some constructive dialogue you know, was you know, going on. You know, right? um, and I will finally just say that uh, my son Oliver is once again prepared to entertain the masses, but um, um, he will do so um, uh, after the discussion in the reception room if anybody wants to go along there. Thank you very much. Thank you.